I'm really pleased to introduce um, Dennis Howard, who's uh, the Glenna for Local RFS Captain, and I'm sure that most people also know you, Dennis, and will be really interested to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Kerry, and um, yeah, great to see everyone here today. Um, I'm here to talk about fires as per the uniform, so that's um, something that hopefully we can get through and help everyone here. Um, my contact details is up there and my email is up there if you want to get in contact with us. Um, just one little disclaimer, apart from the information on Bushfire Survival Plan, um, anything else that I've um, got on there is not official RFS policy. Just need to make that clear. So I think hopefully everyone knows that the RFS promotes a bushfire survival plan and everyone in this area should have a bushfire survival plan. And it can be really, and I know that's hard to see, but it can be as simple as I will leave early when there's a large fire or I'll stay and defend my, my home. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail on that today. It's something that we need to look at at a later date um, because there's a lot of detail in there and we can talk about that at some stage. The main thing that everyone really needs to be aware of is the bushfire alert levels. And this changed um, September last year and it went from six down to four levels. Where you really need to concentrate is on the extreme and catastrophic. And I know that's hard to see, but um, I'll try and, and cover it. Um, so at the top end of catastrophic, it basically says that nothing's survivable. Um, so you should go to somewhere safe. Um, in extreme, well-prepared houses can survive. How well-prepared um, depends on your location, how close you are to forest and a number of other things like that. Um, the two bottom levels, moderate, um, is basically a warning. And the high is get ready to, to enact your bushfire survival plan. Again, I can talk about that at another time. The other thing, apart from those alert levels, is, well, sorry, the, 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 yeah, so when an incident happens, um, on the My Hazards, near My Hazards app, which used to be the My Fires Near Me app, it's been changed to include floods now, if an incident happens in your area, there are three, three levels that you will get on there. Either advice, which means something's happened, you need to be aware of it, think about what you're doing. The watch and act, so that's starting to implement your bushfire survival plan. And the emergency warning. Once it gets to the emergency warning stage, if you're planning to leave, it's basically too late at that stage. Where do you get all this information? Well, according to the RFS, there's a number of sites and places you can get this information. The fire near me or the hazards near me app now. Um, the RFS website, RFS Facebook and Twitter pages. Uh, bushfire information line and local radio. So what's a local emergency radio broadcast in this area? ABC. So if you listen to the ABC, they're usually pretty good in these situations. Yes. Sorry? Um, at this stage, no, we don't have, um, as far as I know, um, I don't know what 2 B does, but 
um, the RFS through its media um, unit does it all through the ABC. It's probably something that maybe we can look at um, and uh, if people listen to 2BBB that could be, that could be yeah, a, a better or another source to look at but the RFS is looking at those ones previously. They're their official sources that they're doing it through so um, 2BBB may or may not end up being official. The, I suppose the, the real take-home message from a bushfire survival plan is it's your responsibility. So if you want to leave your property when there's a major fire, that's fine as far as we're concerned. It's your property. You can leave and get out and go somewhere safe. If you want to defend it, then there's a number of um, helpful steps and that that's in the bushfire survival plan which you can um, which you can go through and make your house and your property possibly survivable. The other thing that I really want to impress too, that, you know, there's no guarantee in a large fire that you're going to get a fire truck sitting at your house to defend your house. If we go back to 2019-20, the fires were so widespread and a number of vehicles and resources we have, we can't possibly cover every, every house, every property in the area. One of the other things, so there, there's a couple of things. There's personnel and vehicles to cover your property. The other thing we need to appreciate and something that you can do for your house and your property is can we actually get a truck in there to your house? What's the width of your gates? What's the height of the vegetation there? Can we turn a vehicle around once we get in there? And do you have any bridges or anything like that that won't take 13.7 tonne? So it's just something to think about on those ones. The bushfire survival plan is, is, is very good and I've had some comments from people saying, oh, it's too difficult to do, I can't understand it, whatever. Uh, as I said, I'd, we don't have time today to go through the whole bushfire survival plan process. What I'm um, proposing we can do is if there's enough people, or you know, even one or two, I suppose, that want to go through a bushfire survival plan on their property, then I'm happy to run a session on that. So things like, you know, what information do you need? Do you need any help preparing it? And if you'd like to attend a preparation plan workshop to go through it, and ideally it would happen on your property, but given the limited time that us volunteers actually have, um, I'd initially like to run, run one down at the fire shed next door. If you want to do that, there's an RFS table up the back there with um, three of our crew sitting there and there's a sheet there. Just put all your details on there and we'll organise that for somewhere in the, sometime in the future. If you've got any questions, just ask at any stage. So if we go back to 2019, 2020, which is the last time we had big fires in the area, what have we actually learnt from that? The main thing we've learnt, and a lot of people used to say, and even within the rural fire service, oh, you're on the north coast of New South Wales, it's wet, you don't get big fires there. I well, think you know, Barry and other people can take it back to instances in the 40s and 50s where we did get big fires through. And the 2019, 2020 fires just, I think, brought it back to everyone's mind that we do get large fires in the area. This is a map of predicted fire paths in on the 12th of November 2019. That's the north coast. So the red areas is where they're predicting 
that fires are going to go, the grey areas are where fires are. If we have a look at something just a little bit closer here, this is the Liberation Trail fire at the back of Coffs Harbour, which came through into Nana Glen. It was predicted that it would come through into the top end of Tallawood Point, Glanfer Valley up there. That it would go down into Yurunga. Now those predictions were based on the weather predictions, the science and everything. We were very fortunate in that the wind didn't get up to the level it was predicted to and that didn't happen. The worst area I think got affected down around Glen Ray. So it is possible. We're heading in, you know, we, we do have climate change as a fact. Um, so these fires, <coughs> large fires are going to be more frequent. Sorry, I just pressed the wrong button. No, it's all right, we came back. That was lucky. The 2019-2020 fires statewide were so extensive that the Rural Fire Service organised the natural, Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre to do some research on how these fires affected people within the state. I've taken a couple of little bits and pieces out, out of that report that are really relevant as far as we're concerned here today. So they asked questions, you know, were people aware of the risk leading into the bushfire season? And I think they believe they, they said there was enough publicity out there that people were actually aware that we're heading into a, a dangerous season. How do people up obtain, understand and respond to warning information. So we'll look at how people get information a little bit, um, how people respond. There's a whole various, lots of different responses to it. Was the information actually useful to anyone? We hope so. How can warning information be enhanced? And that's, that's a really interesting question. I'll look at that in a little bit further too. And the bottom one there, which is really pertinent to what we're doing today, is how did people interact with others to repair, respond or recover? And this is what you know, Kerry and the NCN people are talking about, small neighbourhood groups. So you can actually help each other. Warning information. Can you rely on internet and mobile phones, etc.? to provide you with up, accurate, up-to-date information. I'm glad lots of people shaking their heads. That's good. There's lots of problems. A couple of things is, um, one of the key insights, and it's something that I put out in some emails back in 2019, the fires near me wasn't up-to-date, wasn't accurate. I might have got my knuckles wrapped for saying that, but it was true. And this is actually something that's now come out in a report that's been funded by the RFS. So I might have been right at the time, which is good. So, so this, this is one of the major problems with relying on electronic information to keep you informed. And I think as we all know, here and only a week or so ago we had you know, problems of a blackout that went for seven or eight, eight, nine hours, something like that here. And we are in an area where there's a single feed line comes out from Bellingen and does all of Glenifer Valley. That same feed line goes out along Gordonville, Somerville's Road and out to Thora. So we are very vulnerable to losing power. So that's the first thing you need to be aware of. The other thing is that power outages can affect phone, landline, and can affect mobile phones as well. The, the, the other um, effect that we can have um, with fires, if you have a lot of dense smoke, that can actually limit mobile phone, phone signals. 
So what I'm saying is basically there's a whole lot of great technology there that can give you good information, but it's not necessarily going to work for you. The other interesting point I just thought I'd throw up there too, when we're talking about the fires near me, and you probably can't read it all, but basically the RFS says that the fires near me act and, and that relies on predictions and relies on information that's put into the system. The information they put in the system is from their um, current operational level. It's not necessarily the latest information. It's not necessarily that as up to date as it should be. Um, and the RFS recommends um, that you don't rely on that information provided by the app. You, a number of sources, so use more than just the one source. And again, in that previous one, same size as the previous one, they show you there six sources of information. So use them all. Sorry? <laughs> apart from apart from neighbourhood care groups. Um, so yeah, again again looking at the survey results from this report is you know there there are implications and opportunities for all this and what they're saying is what people are looking for is actually up-to-date information and how do you get up-to-date information and that that's very difficult and some of the things that aren't currently available on any of those apps residents wanted to know where the local fire edge is so if you're sitting here in Glenifer and there's a fire somewhere around here and there's fires all throughout the state Although that might be concerning, the thing that you would like to know and I would like to know is where the local edge of that fire is. How close is it to my home? Where and which direction is it spreading to? So is it coming towards my home? Is it going away from it? And how fast is it travelling? So these are some of the opportunities or that have been highlighted in this report that says what people would like to know. And it's not available at the moment. So how do, how do, we, how do we, you get local information? Where do you get the local information from for a fire in your area? So if we look at it in, in some various areas, in the broad areas, say the whole Coffs Coast, the only place you're really going to get information on is the Hazards Near Me app. It's probably the most reliable. ABC Radio will be broadcasting warnings as well and you can possibly use um, the other RFS social media. Bottom line there, while we're talking about social media, is don't rely on anything that's non-official social media. It's one of the problems that we had back in 2019-2020 and it's the reason why I started putting out emails to all the local residents I had emails from is because there was so much misinformation appearing on social media and that you know, either promotes panic or promotes a you know, feeling that everything's okay and I don't need to worry, both of which can be incorrect. So just be aware of that. Bellingham Shire, again, main source is the RFS sites as spoken about before. Once we come down to Glenifer, the area here, if I can and if I have the ability and the time, I will continue to use the email addresses I've got in the Glenifer RFB account to send out people, send out <coughs> up-to-date information for our local residents. What about your immediate surrounds, your immediate neighbours? This is where neighbourhood groups, as being set up by the NCN, can really help. So if you have a neighbourhood group of you know, a dozen, half a dozen, whatever neighbours, then you might all have different access to different sources of information. Um, some of the problems that we can have 
with some electronic information apart from phones and whatever, and it happened in 2019, is because fires are so extensive throughout the state, everyone was getting onto the RFS fires near me at, and the system was simply overloaded. It couldn't handle the number of inquiries that were coming into it. Uh, depending on which direction those inquiries are coming from, uh, there might be a local bottleneck in the internet, there might be um, regional or state bottlenecks. We can't do much about state bottlenecks, but if you have um, neighbours, someone might have Optus, Telstra, Landline, um, even Mr Musk, Starlink, um, internet access, they're all different ones. So if you have a group set up and have a communication action plan within that group, then hopefully you can share information and find out what's going on. So networks are you know, both sharing information and assisting people. Almost the end of it. Um, neighbourhood safer places, which is one other thing that was identified in the um, CIC report that people didn't understand, didn't know about. Just so everyone's very clear, Glenifer Hall here is a neighbourhood safer place. And the key word is safer. It's not guaranteed to be totally safe. Things can still happen, it can still burn down. But the idea is, if you consider that your house is not safe and is being threatened by a fire, and there may not be a way because of fire everywhere but to be able to get out into Bellingen or Coffs Harbour or somewhere like that, the Glenifer Hall is, na is a neighbourhood safer place. So you should be able to come down here and be safer here than you are at your home. Now we need to, and I've been talking to Kerry about this, and we need to talk to the Hall Committee to work out a plan as to when this hall gets opened up and, how pe and have some people here just to welcome people in and make sure everyone's okay. And that's something that we'll work on in the future. Okay, that's a very quick run through the whole lot of things. Again, um, bushfire survival plans. I'm happy to put your details down. I'm happy to go through all that. Um, and if anyone's got any quick questions on what was there, other than that, we can leave for the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Dennis. I just wanted to make a quick uh, clarification, really, um, in regards to the question about 2 triple B. Um, yes, the ABC is the um, official uh, emergency station you should go to, but um, Council has recognised the importance of 2 triple B to our community and has um, directed quite a large amount of um, funding from the um, disaster recovery funding um, pools to triple B to up upgrade their, um, their equipment, first of all. So they, um, they use that funding to convert their equipment to digital broadcasting, um, to also uh, Im um, improve the, the, the transmitters as well. Um, but importantly also, they're developing um, dedicated emergency broadcast teams. So uh, I think 2BBB is a, a fantastic resource for our community. Um, and. Um, I think we have to be aware, though, that it, is, it still is a volunteer organisation. Um, ABC is there, but if you have the capacity to listen to Triple B, you're going to get, you know, very much more local information and um, correct information there as well. Um, the other thing I was going to say about that is uh, we need you need to have a transistor radio with batteries so you can listen to any radio because of the problems that Dennis was talking about. About uh, yeah, thanks. Are people happy to hold any more questions off until after the, um, Strider's presentation on floods and then we'll have a panel? While Strider's getting up, I'd just like to really thank Dennis. That was a really fantastic and informative <laughs> presentation. And I, I, I also would like to thank you for focusing on the Neighbourhood Care Network communication action plans and I'd just like to mention them a little bit more. The, the whole um, impetus behind the Neighbourhood Care Network is about communication. 
we did a consultation with the community when we set up and the big thing everyone said to us is keep going and focus on trying to make communication easier because of all of the issues that Dennis covered. And so when a local group is set up, the only thing we ask that group to do is to develop a communication action plan with its members and we have a template for that. And we actually encourage people to go back and do things how our grandparents would have done them. So we, we do get ask people to share all of their communication information and go through the mapping process Dennis talked about that said who's got what technology and you know who, who's got a generator and how can we join up if we need to. But we sort of also say let's do an old fashioned telephone tree and door knock and know, know how we're going to be able to get information to our little group that's reliable if all of the services go down. The other thing we do is ask groups to identify with each other who's particularly vulnerable, who might have older people who need extra help or people with disabilities living in the household and go through a process of figuring out who's going to need extra help and how can you do that together as a group or how can you come back to the NCN hub and we can help you get a bit of extra help if you need it as things are going pear-shaped. So really a big plug to put your hand up to help coordinate a local group or get involved in your local group, even if that communication action plan is all you do. It just means we're much better prepared. <laughs>